four, three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, this is episode 25 of the Art of Move podcast, where we're trying to find the grand unified theory of proper biomechanics and how the human body is supposed to move. I'm Anthony Manuel. I'm here with my good friend, Dr. William Raybar, out here in the Canadian Rockies. And we are joined today by Adrian. And Adrian is a really, really interesting dude. I met him 10 years ago, briefly, on my very first week of being a personal trainer, I was working at a good life fitness. There was a little bit of a, a convention for all the trainers to come and, and Adrian really stood out. And I remember all the other trainers were kind of talking about him and, and how good he was doing as a trainer. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to try and be like that guy. And 10 years later, I saw him reposted in one of uh, a go to coaches stories. And I was like, oh, I, I remember Adrian. He's doing Goda now. That's really interesting. And, and I, I checked out his Instagram page and he was kind of blending bodybuilding and a lot of these functional training systems that Will and I have been talking about for the last 24 episodes. So I wanted to get Adrian on because, uh, you know, the, the blending of these training goals and these, these different worlds was something that I've been very fascinated in. I usually go all or nothing with, uh, with different training methodologies. But what really I thought was really cool was how you were able to integrate the principles of biomechanics and still are you know carry the physique of a bodybuilder and still train people with aesthetic goals that are related to bodybuilding so i wanted to kind of pick your brain about that will i know you checked out his instagram page and saw that he had a, a pretty similar progression to you in terms of going from bodybuilding exploring these different movement systems and hopefully you know we're we're explorers of movement truth right so this conversation today is just going to be in uh, a discussion about your own journey of discovering and exploring these different elements of fitness and biomechanics and how you're applying them to your training and what insights you've kind of come on your own personal journey. So Adrian, for those who are listening, uh, what would you say, how, like give, give us a little cliff notes version of you, what you do and what you're passionate about. Uh, I have been working with clients for 20 years. Um, I remember when I first started the gym, I worked as a cleaner and I used to talk to people every day. I started being an accountability buddy for lots of people, one particular old lady in mind. When she told me how much of a difference it made in her life, I went from kind of like a bully mindset to a supportive building mindset. Like I went home, I was just high on the feeling. So I had to become a trainer. So. I actually switched from web design, where I was sitting at a computer, slouching, drinking Coke and having smokes to being a trainer, which is, I had been athletic all my life previous to that. And it really just made me feel good. Next thing you know, I got into bodybuilding. I wanted to be on the cover of a magazine. I wanted to be like the guys I idolized. And I was from a small town. People would tell me, no, and no one from here does that. Don't be silly, you know? But then I just grinded. And I believe it was in 2007, I pulled that off. So I was on the cover of a magazine, so I had hit that. And the whole time, in the background, people said, Adrian's not a bodybuilder. He's just a pretty boy. So I got into bodybuilding. And I ended up doing something called muscle modeling, which was pretty boy bodybuilding. And the WBF is a great, WBF, great organization. I competed there in 2012 and placed 10th in the world. I was ecstatic. I remember being on the posters for the event. I was so proud. I worked so hard. And I proved a lot of people wrong, which was important to me at the time. It isn't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how that changes as we get older. And then I, all this time I worked at a particular large gym for a long time. I appreciate everything I learned there. But I always <laughs> kind of felt slightly different. When I was doing the aesthetic stuff, it was extreme. And then when I switched around to wet method stuff, it was extreme. It was different. People always pointing and looking no matter what I did. Then I switched to some functional pattern stuff, and people were really watching those tricks. And it never really took. Uh, Olympic lifting was kind of a standard. Power lifting, reverse gear lifting. And I just wanted to explore more. And I was walking around Woda this entire time. And I slipped on the ground. Just slipped. My leg split and I tore my adductor mm. right off the pubes. A lot of pain. I had to relearn how to walk. I had a dislocated hip. I have suffered from something called FAI, femoroacetal tubular impingement mm. syndrome. 
And uh, that pain motivates me more than anything else. And that's why I started searching in all the systems everywhere, breath work, you name it. If it made the claim, uh, I didn't look for a peer reviewed study. I just, I looked Mm. Uh, because I just did not want to wake up in pain. And that's brought me to where I'm at now. I've worked with clients and I've used all techniques from all different systems. But there's a commonality. There's a bit of a singularity that kind of runs in a lot of my training now because it's been so impactful. And that is Goda. So that's what brought me here. Cool. Man, that is an awesome story. Um, very inspiring, actually. And I'm, I'm kind of the same way. I was looking for a system to get out of pain. I work with pain patients and I've been in pain myself and it seems to be a commonality amongst people who find Goda is pain. Um, on your journey to Goda, using WEC method, I saw you using the physio strap. I saw you doing functional patterns exercise, May spells. Uh, it looks like you went through it all. What drew you to Goda over those uh, systems you were doing before? What is the difference? Well, one particular dude. Um, Eric, blow ops. I definitely recommend everybody follow that guy. That is my. I love his stuff. Yeah. And in my 20 years, I've gone to a lot of certifications. I've sat there and paid my money and walked out just as certified as the guy who didn't pay attention or participate next to me. You know, done it all. But I'd never hired a coach in 20 years. And I saw whatever it was. Like what I saw, what I saw in Eric, and that kind of pulled me in. And I had one experience, and that really did it. Um, a pain that I had that never shut off, shut off. It didn't stay off. I had to stay out of the water, but it shut off, and that woke me up. And then I started seeing everything differently. I started seeing the way I sat and the way I lived, my thoughts my resting positions, every step. And like all the respect in the world, the guys like David Rep, uh, David Wett, every step is a rep. Started mm-hmm. sitting in because every step I took, it hurt. Uh, just compression pain. Mm-hmm. So I was reminded I had two directions to go, you know, pain or pleasure. And I just kept chasing pleasure. So that did it. Can we can we get more specific with that pain you were having? When did it shut off? What movements were you doing? And when did you really realize it? I can tell you, uh, for example, on my own, I have a labral tear in my right hip. And it was grinding for years until I started doing Goda and drop-ins. And then all of a sudden, no more grinding. This is medically, it shouldn't be that way. I should be, you know, in pain. But it, I found the position to uh, stop that from happening. So was a... Did you have a similar experience there? 100%. I know exactly the exercise. Parallel rockers. Mm. Parallel rockers. I felt so good when I woke up the next morning. I rolled out of bed to protect the position, to protect to feel good. And I got in the rocker position as slow as I could. And I just started doing them with breath work as slow as I could because I knew I hit something. They had me out of pain, and I just wanted to protect it and invest on it hard. Mm-hmm. And I remember that day very well. Um, I've had, I've also torn pec major. I've, I've had a lot of pain. I know what it is to fake a smile and hold my head up and take painkillers, stimulants, everything to fake it, to hide. And uh, I remember doing the rockers. I remember very much the next day, very emotionally powerful. Yeah, wow. My my, uh, my fiance, she's a firefighter and she has FAI as well. Um, that's been something, you know, very, very strong, strong woman. Did a lot of CrossFit, did a lot of Olympic lifting. Um, no problem deadlifting 225 for reps, you know, like very, very strong woman by conventional bodybuilding or powerlifting standards. And, uh, and I remember just last year, it was one of these issues that she was having was, was, she, you know, she experienced FAI and then she had some, some minor labral tearing and we got all the x-rays and everything. And, and I remember 
having this aha moment I was like, how, how is it that she's so strong and she's never had these issues? And then just out of nowhere, you know, she's having this, this tremendous amount of hip pain. I remember looking and watching her stand at the kitchen counter and her feet were like almost parallel to the counter. They were splayed out so far, right? Like they were so duck footed that you could basically put her heels and her toes against the counter. And I was like, oh, you're like mega woda right now. This is, this is, this is basically, you know, this, we got to get you in more secure positions so that you're experiencing less pain. And, you know, she did do a little bit of work with BAM. She did learn some of the positions and some of the, some of the patterns. And, and even, even that little bit seemed to help. And she's still trying to find her stride. And I think the thing that, that, that mentally challenges her a lot is how do I, um, you know, combine to cure patterns or how do I basically do, do this functional biomechanically sound work that's going to, help keep me in, and keep me out of pain while also training things like work capacity and strength because for her work you know especially as a woman in firefighting there's a lot of pressure for her to perform and be stronger and, and have that that almost like athletic presence to keep up with the guys quote unquote so you know do you still do a lot of bodybuilding training yourself on top of your movement practices or is it something that you found that you almost had to give up so that you could Focus more on good biomechanics. Honestly, I don't bodybuild very much at all. I have probably had count on two hands bodybuilding workouts since the pandemic started. Hmm. Um, I wasn't forced to go that way. It was just choice. I was bored. I could, <laughs> I could only do side raises, bicep curls, and 21s leg extensions for so long. Like I God love all the people who still are doing back squats. Just <laughs> adding like a little bit to their PR. That's like but I've been lifting already for fifteen years. Mm -hmm. I like my passion was dying and that thing that they say doctors prescribe for, you know, an antidepressant wasn't working. I, I needed a new challenge. And that like that just lit me up. And I love the fact that all I need is my body. Like, mm. what a novel thought. No external stimulus. That, to me, was worth more. And it was the feeling. That, as far as the aesthetics, everybody knows that's at least 80% diet, right? So I had the muscle. I could do some push-ups if I wanted to. But believe it or not, I don't. I just do groundwork. And that keeps my shoulders and arms in check. But I've built a way better set of glutes than I ever had when I was bodybuilding. Way better. Way Just better lower back. From, from doing, doing mostly drop-ins? Or what, what drop exercises? Drop-ins being, drop being the major deal. Like, and standing in a back chamber, like learning how to control my pelvis properly again. That made a huge difference. But yeah, like, I don't do much bodybuilding at all. I'll go to do it for fun with friends. Because sometimes I just want to step out of my zone and I don't want to be instructing a go to movement. I just want to throw down some juicy arm pump and have a good time. Be a bro. So do you find that when you're trying to introduce these clients to or your clients to some of these principles, do you find there's a lot of resistance or confusion? Or do you find that most people are pretty enthusiastic and, and ready to kind of embrace these ideas? I would say I'm lucky that my clients outsourced me and trust what I'm choosing to be the best decision for them as per my opinion. So I don't really get a lot of bite back. I get a lot of people who you may have to give crumbs and they slowly start to put it together. I think that having people stand in their columns and that fist with stance is very impactful. And that's just a good, small little dose maybe to give them like hey you know we could do those bicep curls or maybe the shoulder press in your columns and do you see the geometry of how this not going to hurt half as much if we just maybe make your feet straight you know we'll put the outside edge straight and we'll maybe form that little dome lift everything up and kind of explain it lightly and they they take a pill they try it and it goes against maybe they're not lifting as heavy the first little while but then they don't care then they go but i'm lifting right i'm lifting properly I don't, none of my clients do this. Mm. None of my clients crack their neck. 
None of my clients are twisting with their back. And they used to be when they were my clients. And I was doing it to them. And now I'm proud to say I'm not. Are you doing any roping with your clients? Because I saw you doing a lot of rope flow, which I do as well. I love it. Um, I, I just love the feeling of the simplicity of the infinity, the figure eight pattern. Um, it works well with the gyroscopes of the thoracic spine. Is, do you do that with your clients? Yeah, generally I'll show them, I guess, the four basic patterns. I think I, most of them will learn at least underhand and drag and roll um, just to have fun. It, like it, it, and for a thorac rotation, that would be about it. But even then, I, when I was learning it, I was in a wide stance. Now, when my clients and I do it, it's right back in those columns with the inside ankle bones in the back chain. So rope flow, a lot of fun for me, but I was still front chain. Now I do all my rope flow from the back chain. And I really enjoy rope flow for a couple of reasons. It's, it kind of makes me feel like I used to when I was a break dancer, when I was in my teens. I put my music on and maybe it's Metallica, death metal. Maybe it's something like Nelly hot in here. And it totally changes the cadence and the flow that I'm rocking out with. And it's just me. And then other times, the, the truth of the reality is I held so much tension in my arms for so long, easily one half of my life, so much tension in my neck that I needed to find a way to take the energy that was stored in my arms to get it out. And I saw all the rope flow boys, again, Eric, Weck, Savage Protocols. I saw they were having fun. I was looking at their arms. I was like, I need that. I found a very similar experience with that. I, I love rope flow. And uh, I find it the easiest way to get nice and loose in the, in the upper body. That's why I was asking you that. Um, is there anything else you do with your clients to get them loose in the upper body? Crawling, perhaps? Crawling, groundwork. Uh, How hard is it to get? a little bit sometimes to... mace. Okay. Yeah, I find, I find similar with the mace. Um, the key for me after finding Gota was doing it in the footwork. Same with the uh, ropes, right? I, I took uh, Eric Tessie flow ops course. And I was like, of course, just do it in the go to patterns, right? But for two years, I was trying all the fancy tricks and um, I was nailing those. But it, if I took a photo, I would have been front chain completely woda as I was doing it, right? So it was absolutely key to find Goda's little tweaks, uh, back chain, and uh, and the footwork is really the key. It's the level up for so many people that I see on the internet right now that are doing these amazing tricks, these releases and everything else and all the respect in the world to them, but they are front chain, their heads are forwards, their back are rounds, their buttocks are tucked under, their arches are flat and they've got amazing tricks and, and it's really cool. But man, when they feel that level up and put it in the back chain, put the inside ankle bone high, get that rotation with the heel away, they'll be glad they did it. Absolutely. And, and just for the audience here, the importance of back chain, being back chain, hips behind your ribs, butt behind your rib cage. This is one of the lowest hanging fruits there are. Like that and being in your columns, as you mentioned, those two things will bring you a lot of fruit and it's a behavior change. So um, that's just a reminder there. Two, two things, front chain dominance, get rid of it, back chain and be in your columns, stand with your ankles underneath your hips. Yeah, um, commonly the, the back chain pelvis people, like a new trainer that would tell you something like upper and lower cross syndrome, they would say that's an anteriorly rotated for pelvis. And it's like, well, it's antroverted pelvis. It's not, we're not looking at the same thing. And we don't even use those terms. We go to a person would use those terms because it's overcomplicated. But just looking at lining up those gyros, I think what's key is understanding those core principles. And when you work with people under clearly explaining them, here's the knee, here's the hip, this is what we're looking for, or at least striving for. And that's why that video recode assessment really is 
the, the, the optimal thing. Uh, anyone can say stand in your back chain, but I can tell you that I'm right uh, side front chain dominant. So I have a coach to watch, to be the eye in the sky, to pick out all the stuff that I have cognitive dissonance for. I, I'm not, I don't want to see that. Or if I saw it, I would have had it fixed already. So having somebody to be picky for me that I respect and I put that stuff to work, it's worthwhile. And the slow-mo video does not lie. And it'll make you get your body fat down too. That's one thing about go to like, you do it in your shorts, shirt off. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't motivate you to get your body fat down, I don't know what will. <laughs> Especially the run, the slow-mo run. <laughs> you yeah. see everything, everything's jiggling when you're doing that, hey? Got um, that Homer Simpson look, you know, the waves. <laughs> and if you're looking at health, longevity, <laughs> decompression, efficiency, being the most optimal human you can, which is what you want to be in the world we're currently living in. We should always want it to be that way, but we got, we got comfortable. Hmm. You want to be abundant. That, yeah. That's where that stuff pays off. I, I find it really interesting, right? Because this conversation, I, I, I'm, I always have like a rough idea of how a conversation is going to go when I invite someone on and I, I almost anticipated it being like, yeah, I still bodybuild, but I'm doing go to practice too. What I find really interesting is the feelings that you're getting from go to the results that you're getting from go to, um, are so antithetical to that sort of bound up tight, you know, almost like neurologically jacked up feeling of, of the bodybuilding, the power lifting, the kind of cult of barbell style of training that you just move it. You moved away from it naturally. And, what I'm hearing a lot about your training history and your experience with training is that a lot of it's feeling based, right? So you were in pain from the way that you used to train. You noticed that, you know, there's the little kinks in your clients every time they're, they're doing some of these heavier training sessions, they might get great hypertrophy results, but they're always, you know, nagging aches and pains. So as you're experimenting with all these things, it's very feeling based, you know, you're, you're working your slings with functional patterns. You're doing some of the momentum work and you're, you're, taking some of that WEC method ideology of, of side bending and doing all this other stuff. But as soon as you experience go to firsthand, that feeling was so undeniable to you. And again, guys, like, like if you listen to yesterday's episode, we talked about the importance of testing things for yourself and not just looking at studies and not just looking at influencers and not just like listening to, you know, things blind without experiencing it yourself. This is why, you know, why Will kind of fell into GOTA. This is why I'm a big adherent of GOTA. Now hearing you say that, you know, with a history of bodybuilding and all these other different methods, the feeling of doing this practice is so undeniable. In terms of your day-to-day -day life, how do you feel differently in your body now than you did when you were you know, either doing bodybuilding or some of these other functional, like it, it, what, what's the defining difference in terms of how you feel? Like a river with no dams. Hmm. Um, people will talk about the chakras being blocked. My root chakra was blocked. My pelvis, everything blocked. Uh, my CT junction, my throat chakra blocked. Uh, it's a lot of deep work, you know, there's like with, if you can, you can go far, it can be much beyond the biomechanics, the ego controls a lot of those biomechanics and, uh, you gotta confront some dragons along the way. So it makes for a pretty rough journey. And, you know, I remember always cracking my third back. I had huge traps. I was yoked. I remember laying on the couch, watching TV, trying to feel relaxed, but I couldn't because I'll be running 400 to 800 megs of a caffeinated pre-workout every day and just stored energy, hands that were neither open or closed. And I just hated it. And I kept trying to use bodybuilding to make myself better looking, stronger, fortified. I was locking myself in too. Mm. Oh, I went a little too fringe with it. Uh, and I used it in a way that I think a lot of people out there do. I think a lot of people, some of the best bodies are built some breakups, right? 
<laughs> I think a lot of people use it to sometimes get out of pain, but I can tell you that, you know, that lifting is going to keep you and put you in pain. Mm. And it may feel like a band-aid, a little, you bump your elbow and you rub to change the nerve impulse of that pain that you're feeling emotionally, but you got to confront that. And you can't just go lift it away. You, you'll never be strong enough. You'll never be good enough looking. As soon as you hit it, you want to move to the next level. It's not even about other people. But with Gota, you start focusing on moving better, not being a better athlete than anyone else, just almost like collecting the coins to level up in the Gota, and you feel better each and every other way. And then wouldn't it be a novel thought that if you want your body to perform better biomechanically, you would think about the nutrients you're putting in that body, the hydration, the lifestyle you're living with that body. So. 90% of my life is probably living in that go to system. And then I will go lift and do other exercises because there's not a lot of go to, to build a peak in my bicep. But I'm, I'm still going to want that for a few more years. So I'll go do some concentration curls or some preacher curls, shape out that arm. But I, I, I also tell you, as soon as I go to my groundwork again, my arm doesn't even want to straighten. I go back to that same feeling of being bound up like I was before. So the battle there is not really in my body at all, is it? The battle's in my mind. And I think a lot of people, if they really dig deep, deep down, they'll identify that. I don't think they're going to want to admit it. I think anybody, some of the people, like, they want to tell someone their PR, how many chins they did, or I can do a front lever. That's cool. And those are nice tricks, bro. But I like. I still get people ask me how much I bench. <laughs> I, I'm be 40 years old. Body feels better when it's 30. When I was looking my best, it's it's it's, it's a bit of a trade off. And like you, you got to learn that all on your own. Like I, I, I don't think anyone could have told me otherwise. And I appreciate every step along the journey. But I'm trying to convey very much for people who may be feeling these pains already or identify with what I'm saying that, you know, the internet likes to make fun of bros now when they train, you know, that, that's like the cool thing for a trainer to do. They do the bro video where it's like, he's wearing the stringer and stuff. That's a lot of dudes. Mm -hmm. I, I know dudes who built those muscles because they used to get beat when they went home. They didn't want to be beat no more. That's not me personally, but I know those dudes. Mm. Everybody goes to gym for their own reason. There's not if you're not gonna make fun of one group, don't make fun of the rest. It's just like don't pick somebody out. I remember I went to a yoga class in that Globo gym, and I died inside that night. That instructor alienated me, didn't help me mm. at all, and, and and just pretended like I wasn't there. I was front and center. I was right in front of that mat and those incense. And I went home, I held my chin up, but I did my best. But I broke. And I never want to do that to anybody. Mm. That was one of the worst feelings I've ever had in the gym. And I tore my peck in the gym. And someone broke me because I didn't fit the look. I was coming to somebody for help. I was broken inside. I just went through a total life reset. Lost everything right down to the salt and pepper and the butter out of my fridge. So now, yeah, everything's motivated by me. I, I never thought about it until today. Everything I do is motivated by pain, trying to get people out of pain, trying to help people. And I don't wait for studies. As long as I know I'm not going to do harm, I try something, see how someone feels. Yeah. And there's a profound effect. Who am I to deny it? And they make the choice in the end. I'm, I'm just a light. They follow me or they don't. Not all my clients need 100% perfect. If you're listening, I know it. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope that I help them make better choices. And if I can have clients walking around, if I can go call them check and they'll harden up and fix it, they're going to have a few more years of enjoyment in their life that they may not have had. I can't statistically prove that. But again, when you feel it, you'll know. And there's going to become a point in time for most people where 
they're not going to be able to move the way they want. And anything that can get you out of that is probably a good thing. Because if you don't move, we know what's going to happen. Mm. Sound good. You brought up a really, really interesting point about the mental side of people's goals, right? And Will and I have talked a lot about when we're addressing different systems, what you do and how you practice is really contingent on the types of goals that you have. Um, and even right now, I just, you know, I had a shoulder surgery. It's uh, three, two weeks, two, uh, three weeks today, three weeks ago today, I had a shoulder surgery and, uh, and my partner looked at me, you know, I've been sitting on the couch. I haven't been doing too, too much. It's like, you know, I'm out of a sling and I'm moving around a little bit. It's great. Um, my partner looked, he's like, Hey, your arms are a little bit smaller. And I was like, yep, they sure are. I haven't, I haven't been doing too much. You know, I haven't been doing any pull-ups. I not, I can't do push-ups. Like my shoulder has literally been in the sling. I've been icing it and taking painkillers. And, you know, I, I, I injured my shoulder lifting and, you know, part of me was like, yeah, just accept that. That's okay. You know, <laughs> your arms are a little bit smaller. So what, but there was still this part of me. You know, I started lifting weights because when I was 15, I weighed 285 pounds. I was really overweight. And I got into training to feel more confident in myself. And, and I started associating, you know, I kind of came to this. I had to go through my own personal journey, realizing that my body wasn't my value and, and et cetera, et cetera. But I had to go through the process of losing 100 pounds and getting jacked and getting super strong to realize that, to realize that it wasn't mm. you know, that, that, that happiness point, right? And what you're talking about of you know approaching a movement practice with the express intent of feeling better of becoming unblocked of moving better um will i know your your goal is to be a ninja when you're 80 right to be able to move around like a ninja when you're 80 to be Absolutely. able to have longevity in your movement right i think uh, being able to assess where some of these goals come from in the extremism of your goals. I remember at one point I wrote my, you know, I, I, I write my goals out all the time. And I remember early in my training career, it's like, I want to deadlift 700 pounds. That was my goal. And I think about it, it's like, why the hell did I want to do that? Why did I want, and, and like you said, you'll never be strong enough to lift up your own emotional problems essentially. But I was in my head, it was like, I, you know, the things mentally that I was struggling with, I thought, if I can deadlift eight, you know, seven, 800 pounds, then I can lift anything. I can, you know, I can bear the burden of anything in my life. Basically, it's like the amount of struggle that you have to go through to do that. You know, maybe I'll be strong. But that's, that's, you know, I think this is, this is a really cool point. You know, you, you went through your own personal journey and you, you achieved your goals of bodybuilding and you proved the people wrong and you, you went through that whole process. And now it's like, no, I want to feel good. I want to feel good. I don't want to be blocked. I want to be able to relax. That's another thing is like when I was powerlifting, I could never relax enough. I, I, I barely slept because my nervous system was always just like ready to fire at any second, cool. right? So for people who are, you know, and, and I, I still feel this resistance myself in terms of like, I, I mostly do go to now. Even my rehab has been mostly go to informed. Um, I do a little bit of flexibility work to kind of counteract some of the tightness that I've created in, in specifically gymnastics. Like you said, doing the front lever, like my lats are so bound up from trying to learn how to do a front lever that I'm still trying to, you know, undo that, that fascial tightness that I created. Um, but there's still that resistance to letting go of trying to be jacked and, and having that sort of social proof of, you know, and, and that social expectation of you know being masculine and strong and big and you know like how how do you you know you said you know you're you're 40 and you feel better than you did when you were in your 30s for someone who's younger who who kind of knows that they want to feel good and they don't want to block themselves off but there's still that resistance to letting go of say lifting and letting go of that masculine like over masculine that overcompensation approach to lifting weights and, and how would you kind of approach that? I think it would probably require a little bit of rapport mm. to go for the deep dive into the, the, the true, the darkest and the lightest why that someone, well, why are we doing this? And what do we want to achieve? And then from there, I think I would let a person have an experience and 
if I slowly start slipping in things that I think they need, like a pill wrapped up in something that they want, a little bit more, a little bit more, keep raising the dose, titrating the dose just a bit more. And they get the point. And they can have both things. It's both finding the correct ratio for them. For example, how well, how woda were they in the first place? Hmm. Like not everybody who's going to start goda is going to be very woda. There's just walking around godas, you know? <laughs> so that person probably could do a lot more lifting engine, a lot more of that reverse gear. I work with a gentleman who actually trained with American top team front chain, but he, you need a lifting engine when you're in MMA, you gotta be suplexing people around. <laughs> so it, that's his place. He's got one foot that's extremely woda. That's his pivot foot, you know, but now it's not going to be anymore. We're going to straighten out those toes. We're going to be pivoting where he should be. And it was undeniable. As soon as he went through a punch, he put the hip into it, got the heel away, got everything. He saw it. We slowed it down, took the video, looked at it. It's like, which guy do you want to fight? <laughs> that guy. I'm like, so you don't want to go near that guy? Why not? Let's become that guy. Let's go to the higher self. Let's do the hard stuff. Like, I get it. Your toes are turned out. They've been that way all your life. You were probably born that way. It's what you think. Your feet are flat. You're probably born that way. Hmm. Let's change it. Dentists, doctors, they, they, you know, you can reset a bone. You can change teeth. Put some braces on. It's just how much work you want to put in. And try to get people living in that go to mindset, that system. And the more they live in that system, they could do the reverse gear lifting and kind of get away with it a little bit mm -hmm. if they still had the, the vibe. You know, like, you are not prop. No, no, you are not going to build, insert magazine cover name arms with Gota. But you can do a bicep curl standing in the back chain in your columns. And you'll be a lot stronger for it. And then, you know, you want to throw in a few other ones, do that until it doesn't suit you anymore. That's up to it. It sounds like almost, you know, give, give people the space to go through their own journey, but still plant the seeds and still get people to experience what it's like to, to feel those biomechanics, right? To, to, to feel what it's like to, to embody those principles. And then as much as possible, if you are training for things that, like you said, program in the reverse gear or, you know, are more aesthetically focused to, to try to do that within the math of these go to principles and also just acknowledge that, Hey, you're going to program a little bit, but like focus on living within these principles first, experience it for yourself. And then, you know, down the line at, at some point, maybe that bicep curl isn't going to be as important to you. A large portion, one third of my business are in the film industry actors. Hmm. held to a certain level, almost held to what the director needs for that scene. There are times where I worked with, I worked with one character for a show on CBC called Moonshine. He hmm. had to look like he had been doing a night of drinking shirtless. So we had to bring him in with dehydrated, sunken eyes. He couldn't be carb loaded. He could only be long and stringy. So we had to control his diet differently. But I had him do every other exercise that he did as close to those go to principles along the way so that he didn't get hurt doing it. It's a quick thing that I would do with a lot of these actors. They're on their feet then they're in those little chairs, you know, the rector on the back, that kind of stuff. It's not very comfortable. It's really hard on their body. So Adrian, how can I decompress? I'm currently working with another individual, AJ Buckley. He's on CBS's SEAL team and mm. I got him in a men's fitness magazine. Got his jacked. I mean, SEAL team, come on. But we do decompression. And, and, and all those things in the background to ensure that they not only have the look, but he can go home and play with his children and have the best life. But when all that's behind him, his golden years are golden. Hmm. Yeah, so I, I found similar uh, experiences with bodybuilding where um, I got into it and it was just default because that's who my heroes were. The, you know, Arnold, my brother had magazines 
And it's really easy as a kid to just open up the magazine and see, oh, that's what I want there. He looks like a superhero. So then that's your, you know, you take that goal from a young age and you just go with it. And uh, it would be great if we had more, you know, go to heroes or heroes that, you know, looked at longevity and looked at movement as the primary focus over, you know, aesthetics. Although it doesn't have to be that way. I, I think that would be a, a better way to go about it. So maybe we're on the leading edge of that. I totally agree. If I had to pay more attention to Bo Jackson and less attention to Hulk Hogan, I'd probably be in a better shape today. I mean, Bo Jackson is probably one of the best athletes going. He's he's pretty go to. <laughs> I mean, you can find video of everyone with a little misstep, but mm-hmm. Bo, Bo knows whatever sports he wants to. And I emulated fake. Oh, yeah, brother. And it definitely appealed to me. You know, like strong, strength, alpha type of person that people want to go to in a time of crisis, the type of person that stands up. It's a, it's like all of that is great. But from a movement perspective, definitely not. I mean, that did Hulk Hogan now, I think, five back surgeries in. That's mm. definitely from being Loda, not just the slams. You can see it in professional wrestling. You see it a lot in the very large gi- giants. You look at their low back. And their pelvis is just driven into a posterior front chain looking tuck. Their low backs look like a turkey platter and so compressed, so bound up. And I think a lot of people who shoot for neutral, they have the best intentions, but they need to shoot a bit further because they fall out of the neutral real quick. And we, we, we got those two eyes. We look at something, we lock in and we go to it. We're locomotive. In nature, we don't do as much transverse spinning as people think. <laughs> and if you're sitting neutral, yeah, that's a great, great position. But if you want to go on a forward gear, it's about being in the back chain, not necessarily being neutral. And if you want to feel decompressed and have muscles disengage, maybe go to neutral, go to a resting position, like a supine 90 degree tie those legs off of the yoga strap, do some deep diaphragmic breathing, and really start letting everything surrender. That's when those positions are great. But when you want to start driving forward, you want to be the guy that people don't want to run at, the guy that's going to run over. (laughs) Back chain all the way, baby. Yeah, so... With uh, with back chain and front chain, I, I see this almost nowhere. Like the go to are really the only system that heightens the importance and makes it that simple. Because as a chiropractor and, uh, you know, looking for so long, it was always about anterior tilt, posterior tilt, anterior shift, posterior shift. But there was never an emphasis on butt behind rib cage. It's literally that simple, right? And if you keep that, then you're in the forward gear. One sentence really sums it up there. Um, yeah, again, the emphasis everywhere is tilting. And I think that's secondary to the actual uh, position of your pelvis being behind the rib cage. I think you can have more of an anterior tilt than people think if your butt is behind your rib cage, right? And what most people would call front chain, they would call a pelvic tuck, right? So there's a lot of confusion there. And I think Gota really simplified that to a a major degree that's so user friendly because just get in your back chain. It's a behavior. Are you back chain in your uh, seated postures or your um, resting postures? User friendly. That sums it up. We can put as much technical biomechanics jargon on it as possible, but the quickest, most efficient way to communicate it to a client, the simplest way, user friendly is where it's at. I think the first time I saw back chain was, God, forgive my ignorance on how to pronounce this, but Gokel, Gokel, Esther Gokel method. I think that's the first time I saw back chain and I saw anterior till the pelvis. I mm. snuffed it up because I had gone to a couple of weekend courses and that's what that was. Boy, was I wrong. And I have no problem admitting it. Uh, for years, I coded people the wrong way. And There's actually on my Instagram story today, there's a woman in a video with flames. That's uh, Dr. Marianne Hudek. 
I've trained her for 17 years. So she has like 15 years of motor training from me and she's switched to go to just like that. Mm. She's a dancer, a tap dancer, a ballet. She just moves better. She's going to be 64. She doesn't look 64. Powerful woman. And I like, it was extremely flattering to have her trust me 100%. So we're going to switch to this method that most physios probably going to look at. Her daughter's a physiotherapist. There's no fight back resistance argument because there's nothing to argue with. And we mm-hmm. control the nutrition. And we control the driver of the nutrition, the mindset. And then she has the body she wants and a better booty than she ever had, coincidentally. Drop in. <laughs> so, that. again, with clients, like, I've been really fortunate. But it's generally all the look for me is now coaching the, pro- the appropriate nutrition. Not just macros and micros, too. Like eliminating process as much as possible. Um, and alcohol. Mm. Uh, there's, it's, there's some nasty trends going on in the world with the pandemic and Uber Eats and alcohol and escapism. And I'm very fortunate that I am hired by people who just want to confront and want to build up. And it, that's inspiring. It inspires me every day. I work with people who have never lost their spirits through this pandemic. And we've all relied on each other. But when I switched my business from 18 years in a gym, in the same gym, I Mm. I could stay there forever. I had a reputation. I started working from home just like this. All my clients, I think 80% stayed with me. Some of them have been with me 10 plus years. And that's why I'm fortunate. They trust me to make that jump. And then what happens? I sprinkle it on my Instagram. I don't say anything. I don't tell people about inside ankle bone low. I don't really like the shame style of teaching. Hmm. It communicates to me when I see the guys on Instagram put up the inside ankle bone low and they show the injuries, which I guess is a topic right now showing injuries, even though don't deny the tape. I think it's all in the delivery. People just want to get angry. Well, they're, when they're making money off an injury, yeah, as a side effect of trying to protect people from a reoccurring thing. We all know the SADS principle. Don't deny what you're looking at. So it shouldn't really be about posting it or not. It should be about admitting there's some cognitive dissonance going on with those coaches who are hating me right now. Oh, I'm just a piece of shit, bro. But wouldn't I be the right guy to work with all those other piece of shit bros that are in those gyms? There's tons of them. And there's lots of girls with booty bands there's lots of people, way more people training them into WOTA. They need help. Mm. And they don't need shame. Love. So try to lead and, and try to have people see things. And when they're ready to see things, you can't force that. And then hopefully that's why that first communication is so important with that client. They're taking a huge risk. They're, they're putting themselves out there. They're vulnerable. They're going to share everything, their pain over time. So trying to be the most caring, loving, understanding dude you can. Saying less. And I'm a talker. I have Nikes on my lips. (laughs) (laughs) But listening to those clients and helping them get in any way I can. First, it's anything I can do to hook them. If it means the world to them to have the calves, we're going to build the cats. We'll build them well. And then we'll tear them down and rebuild them again later when you change your mind. But a lot of people out there need a lot of help and support. They need an outlet. They need a confidant. And they there's so many people hurt. So when it comes from the, the aspect of maybe the more shame marketing aspect, it's all in the delivery. And I think to counter that, you can't control how someone's going to receive it. They're going to see it. And if they're in that mindset that they're a victim up and they get all angry because someone shows that this person's woda. Well, this is woda. It's worst. They make that association. And they think, well, I don't want to be called a woda. Mm. 
I, I totally feel where they're coming from. And that's when you explain to them, it's like, no, we're going to try to get out of the WOTA. You know, it's not like you're not a fat person. You're a person with fat on you. We're going to lose that fat. You're not a WOTA. You're a person who's operating in a WOTA system. So we're going to get you out of it. We're going to recode. Hmm. And um, I think like the mind is the driver of everything. So how you deliver that to a client or a patient, it's going to be, that's going to be up to the professional. It's, it's very interesting. Shame never works. It's very interesting when you said, um, it, it was a while back, but you were talking about uh, basically when you start GOTA or you did 13 years of WOTA training and then all of a sudden you stop, it was GOTA. And then, you know, you went on from there as a trainer, how hard do you think it is ego wise to put away what you did? Um, you know, for instance, I was squatting 400. Right. And then all of a sudden you have to put that away and be like, oh, accidentally, I was training you wrong here uh, because I didn't have the proper knowledge. Um, let's go to this system over here, which is much, much different. Uh, basically, my question is, how do you how did you go about that? Is it just sprinkling it in or um, is there something else to that? Personally, deep dive. Hmm. All in. Uh, it's the way I like to roll for myself. I wanted to test it as best of my abilities. I wanted to give it all the aspects of nutrition that I would for bodybuilding and the mindset, the grind, the hard work, the commitment, the discipline, the accountability. I wanted to just take it and sub in a different system. And that, that's how I did it with clients. Obviously, that doesn't happen with everyone, but... I didn't think it was doing it justice to try to blend methods until I understood all of those methods. Popular quote is, I want the contents, not the container. I love it, you know. But people who try to blend, blend things without having those things from the system and understanding the true power or how much work actually goes into getting a person from the front chain to the back chain. It's different for all of us, but... For those coaches out there, like, I mean, 15 years of first care lifting at a world level, I was woda. So it's, it's taken me so much work. I, I admire, like you'd mentioned coach Bam. I love watching that guy move. Another girl, coach Carly. Mm, They're just beautiful great. movers. I'm a fan of both. Um, sure. I have to work really hard to get there. I watch them and they're, that's inspirational stuff. But it's very hard on my ego to identify with that. Like you asked, you know, a lot of people, I, I don't look like them at all. It'd be very hard for people to make that switch. But you got to remember, your ego is not your amigo. <laughs> if you really want to grow, it's holding you back. That's a good one. I haven't heard that before. Yeah, I've never heard that before either. And I've heard a lot of shit talking quotes about the yeah. ego as well. I mean, I, I definitely have gone through, I'm still going through, frankly, uh, you know, my own personal shedding of attachments to different training styles. I've, I've been involved in a lot of different um, groupthink organizations, right? Like I was part of the Athletic Truth Group, which is like the knees over toes guy. Um, I did the range of strength certification program, which was amazing. And it was very um, community oriented. They have a community network. The CrossFit gyms that I coached at, um, it's all community, right? So you're 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 not only um, personally identified with these things, but you're also connecting with other people who have this image of you or this idea of you. And part of you almost feels like you're letting these people down when you s switch to a different uh, training modality or a different philosophy of training. You know, before it was like, oh, you're you're the strong dude, and you can you train the bodybuilders who who win the shows, or you. You know, you're the CrossFit coach that that's crushing the wads every day and you're pushing people super hard and you're, but then letting go of that identity is, is challenging, right? And I find ego, generally speaking, is, is just an attachment to an idea of yourself. It's, it's, it's an, it's, it's a clinging to an, an a, a way that you used to identify or aspects of your identity that you want to protect at all costs. And that can be a real obstruction to, to, to experience. And again, always encouraging firsthand experience to even experiencing for me, it was again, the experience of, of, of Goda 
and and well first of all i had to stop training crossfit because i jacked up my shoulder so bad i popped my shoulder away from doing a snatch and then that sent me down my own spin of trying to again same thing try to get it out of pain how do you how do you end up coming to this situation when you finally realize that what you're doing is hurting you and then you have to you have to come to terms with the fact shit if this hurt this is hurting me and this is the 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 effects the detrimental effects of these things that i'm pushing on other people that i'm hurting other people too right and and having that be like like accepting that about yourself where it's like you were unconsciously or unwittingly hurting these people that you were caring about that were giving you their money and their attention and their time and their trust that's a hard thing to let go of too so i think it's really cool to be able to, that, that that you were you know able to take these you know these years and years and years of training a particular way and be like Look, I'm going to swallow this pill and just acknowledge that maybe I was wrong and there's a better way to do it. And I'm going to be able to help people because because that, that's ultimately what this is about. That's, you know, that's I mean, well, that's why you do chiropractic. So I, I was in personal training was because I was inspired by my own transformation. I wanted to help others. Like you said, the way that you talk with the level of empathy and the level of care that you have, it's, it's not, it, it sounds like it's not just a job. It's like a calling for you to be able to help people in this way. Right. And it's also why you're, you know, once you realize you, you can't go back, you can't just keep, keep doing this for, for other people. You'll still have listen and you'll still have that empathy, but it's for all the listeners. It, it'd be a different thing for everyone, but how powerful, of an experience would it have to be for you to change everything you've done and you've built yourself into from the ground mm. up i i went all in my career my life my passion what i do six out of seven days a week six to eight hours a day for years like to drop that how powerful would that have to be to drop all those exercises that made me who I thought I was mm. and that I thought mattered to everybody else and to trust that there may be a better way, but the way I was going was not working. It was failing. I was just treading water and not really looking like it. Nobody would have known my pain. I wouldn't have shown it on my face. I wouldn't even admit it because then I'd have to admit in a failure in my system. Mm -hmm. I would go see chiropractors, you know, my hips be a little cattywampus. And, and I would see chiropractors even after I have a brother who has had his thorax spine snapped on a chiropractic table. And I still go because my neck was so bound. So I ever having a family member get rode off. Uh, you know, not no one's intention to do that, but it happened. It's fine and a twist. And I still go. And I, after a while, like, you know, I had all this tape on my body. It was kind of working, but I was still taking NSAIDs. It just, I never wanted to admit it. And then I hit that tipping point that where it just was too much, not walking losing my sex drive and not losing it because of PEDs pain mm. watching the physique that I had worked for with those exercises going away because I just couldn't do it anymore and now I can I can go back in I can do those things I can still back squat I can sumo dead I, I, I can't I just don't want to the only thing that would make me want to do it is to just go be part of that community of all those people who do that when I switched to Gota as a very pandemic based, it was amazing transformation for me. It took me out of a gym with mirrors. Every day of my life, I stood in front of a mirror judging myself every day. And I'd watch other people swarm and I was held to a standard in there. You know, be the guy. Thank you very much. That was extremely flattering, by the way. <laughs> but I was faking it. <clears throat> and when I started working out just i remember it's just one dude in the mat i took on that challenge and i loved it i was just hooked i felt strong without anything else 
mentally just strong to know that my government could take away anything. A virus could take away anything, but it's not going to break me. I could work out on this mat twice a day, every day, like Bane, but Bane with Gota. <laughs> and I could be better. And then I knew people would watch it, that I was that dude who's keeping muscle mass up. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to keep that muscle mass and do as best I can to make this aesthetically pleasing while still trying to work those global go to laws in there. And, and slowly you can see it on my Instagram, the progression, the tricks go away. And then it's just me, one dude and a mat. Mm. So what is your training regimen right now or your movement practice? What does that look like on a daily basis? No particular order. Because I kind of operate off what my body tells me. Like symptoms are your best friend. But uh, there is one to two meditation sessions a day. Anywhere, any amount of time. Sometimes if I have more in between clients, I'll take it. I might just do walking meditation. But then there's breath work. Always pre go to session is the baseline breath work patterns. Then from there, go to anywhere from one to three hours, depending upon how much time I have in my day. I still, as you see right now, I'm sitting in size. Of, you'll see me switch to cowboy. I'm going to stay in those positions. I don't own a work desk. I, I, I don't. This is how I work, just like this. It's much healthier. But, yeah, go to three hours a day, some red light meditation, sometimes some hemi-sync I try everything that promises like a more loving heart, less pain, tension. Uh, I'm happier than I, mm. I, I like a child. I'm, I'm, I'm closer to that than I've ever been. And it's probably been 20 to 30 years, just not lesser. And I attribute a lot of that to go because that physical pain has held me back. I've had that chiropractor, you've probably seen this, so many of my workouts involve tears. Uh, it's a good thing. I, I quite actually like, um, what's the other one? Wait. I quite like, um, I can't remember right now, but TRE. Mm. Tension release exercise. Quite like the, the experience of that. It's still loaded. But I love getting out that tension, and I love standing up stronger. I love a decompressed that? spine. TRE. What is the tension release exercise? Yeah. It's a series of leg exercises that focus on the quads and the adductors. There's not. A, there's some hamstring, quad adductors, hamstrings, and then rectus abdominis lengthening, and then you lie on your back, butterfly position, and the legs start to go into a shake. Mm. So deep core release, but it's an unwinding. So we're all wound in our own way, physically and emotionally. And it's, it's a, it's a massive release. And, and I think myself included, so many of us go to the gym, we chase the rush, we take the pump, we chase the rush, we feel strong. We don't truly get that release. Mm. And, and it's the blend of having it all. And a lot of bros don't want to go to yoga. They've got a mental hang up, but Gota is a sexier looking athletic thing that is actually still better for them. So I get so many bros right now. Hey, man, what's that thing there where you're standing doing that like floating lunge? I'm like, that's a drop in. They don't know how to explain it. They're curious. Mm. And I think I do everything I can to encourage that curiosity. Because there are so many people like me out there that are just searching. Yeah. And that's, that's ultimately, I mean, this, this podcast was kind of born out of that, that searching as well. I mean, even me coming to a biomechanical approach instead of just blitzing my body with, you know, high thresholds movement with a barbell, like that, that's it, that comes from a sense of, of searching for something. I, I found it really interesting that you, you referred to the, the sensation of like being like a child, right? Cause a lot of the go to principles were even observing the most natural state that a human being can be in the baby fresh out the womb shows these spiraling patterns, the heel away pattern, the back chain dominant once they start standing up, the crawling pattern with the spinal engine, you're almost unraveling 
all this nervous system conditioning that you know sitting training doing all these different things in your body they're they're adding these layers of conditioning and when you do a practice like a goda and you feel that nervous system shake or you do those releasing things what, you know what what is it you know what is it that you're releasing you know maybe you're releasing a a, a neural holding pattern that's been programmed in through poor behaviors and when you release those things that childlike state or that that's that sense of of innocence or freshness or that openness that comes that's that's the natural state that you're in so when you're getting these releases and you're kind of coming back to that natural state that's the effect at least the, the mental effect and a lot of people don't talk about the mental effects of these these movement patterns either we we kind of alluded to it in some of the episodes we've done but it's very interesting because you've talked about some of the mindset shifts that you've had um, just from taking this approach, this this desire to be less bound up, this opening of the the energy points, those chakras that you were talking about, um, you know, when when you un, un, unload these things, you you're carrying less burdens mentally and emotionally. You have a different mindset about nutrition, for example, because um, you know maybe you're doing a shirtless recode, and that has something to do with it, but even movement efficiency and, and the the feeling that you have in your body you be like my own experience was i became very sensitive to the types of food that i was eating and how it affected me energetically and like the the actual physical mm -hmm. energy that i was having and the, the the effects on my systems just from when you do when you're doing a movement practice and you're and you're creating this internal awareness of of how movement feels in your body then you start to also realize how food feels in your body or how different nourishment feels in your body so it's very very interesting you get that that sort of mental side to will like i mean you you went from being like hardcore crossfit powerlifting too did you find like a huge mental shift when you started doing the things like boxing and when you start even because i mean you you stopped lifting weights for a while before you got into gota what was your mental sort of experience you know going from weightlifting to more movement and then movement to go to specific movement yeah so um i was in crossfit and i always lifted i always power lifted just heavy weights crossfit was a good segue because i like gymnastics so i found myself one day i'm after taking you know c4 or something like that trying to lift you know do deadlifts of 315 i'm like i just don't even want to do this anymore i don't have the <laughs> will to do it anymore uh started boxing started doing break dancing just off a of, uh, course online and I found a lot of enjoyment like that I was coming back to being you know more like a kid more like I'm playing but um, I, I searched functional patterns got into WEC method uh, just everything under the sun experimenting every day every day on my lunch I go out I'm in the mountains I go to my favorite spot I'm all alone and I experiment for one two hours um, and it really I was trying to find something like Goda. And when I did, I'm like, oh, this is it. There's, there's a universal pattern here. There's something simple. So the amount of energy I actually have to put into coding is so minuscule compared to lifting heavy, heavy weights for a goal of lifting more heavy weights and getting a bigger body, right? So there's a lot of energy. It's an energy hole in that... Um, you have to put a lot of your thoughts, a lot of your actual food, energy goes into that and you bound yourself up where now I feel loose. I feel like a kid, like you mentioned, I'm, I'm able to go out. I go for runs. I'm spinning around. I'm jumping off stuff. I'm, you know, it's, it's back to being like a kid. And uh, I enjoy my days way more doing that than having to psych myself up to go to the gym and, and complete a quote unquote workout. It's just, it's different now. I can sprinkle it into my day. I think if we were in the same city, the only thing stopping us from being training buddies, we, we probably wouldn't want to share it with anyone else. But what you're <laughs> talking about doing, going off, like I, I like to go to the park by the water, headphones off, but just like you, that same experience. And that be, the only thing is, whenever anybody else comes, it takes away from the me time. As a trainer, we don't get a ton of me time, but I wouldn't be surprised if I lived in your city one day, if you looked over <laughs> and you on that other right peak, there. it'd be me with that yoga mat out, you know, I'd probably be that dude. You'd be like, where's that weed smell? 
<laughs> that would be me feeling my go to for anybody out there like not the joe rogan this podcast but go on shrooms is an interesting experience mm. um <laughs> micro dosing <laughs> things like that i can speak yeah. to that personally but i would be that dude right there i am i wait until it's nice enough to go outside so i can be out and i don't use a mat realistically it's all grounding on the grass mm. in the sand uh, i'm playing with nothing and i think that really kept my spirits up through this whole pandemic is people would get their gym build their body lose their gym lose their body and i just get up and take my water bottle and go to the park you I'd always have the ground right for hours <laughs> uh, just like losing yourself like that is it, it just feels human and it Everybody's got their own version of what their human is, especially with the metaphor thing coming down the pipes. Mm -hmm. But there's something about the absolute minimalism, the silence. That's There's a lot to be found there. And I, I wouldn't even talk in my sessions. No music, just the waves. Mm. And I would time my cadence to the wave of how I do with my rockers. And I zen right out, total flow state. Yeah, I mean, I, I still, no, I still make my way out. <laughs> yeah, and I, I go out to Halifax pretty regularly as well because um, my brothers still live there and I got a bunch of family out there. So next time I'm in town, I'll, I'll hit you up and we'll we'll get a movement session and we'll, we'll make our way down to the park and do do exactly that. As long as I'm not cutting into your, your solo time. <laughs> no, I would absolutely love that. There are a number of dudes who have seen me on Instagram who have come through this way. They make the point of, hey, man, let's – get a session and one dude showed up on the Halifax waterfront one day because he said I always saw you on Instagram do it video doing it he goes I'm from here I know the time of day I happen to be down this way I knew you'd be here and I was like <laughs> I'm glad you stopped That's brother wild. awesome he was actually it's another like trainer for that big gym no way that's so yeah. funny he's a I believe he's still a trainer in Ontario for that gym I work there you go. another third of my business is working with personal trainers on whatever mm. they should need. I try to just share my experiences and they, they, I, I'm working with a few of them right now on dietary things. And it's amazing how mm. that trickles down into their business as well. Right on. So, so Adrian, for, for people who are, day. who are, it's, it's, it's all connected, right? Like it's, it is like, it is the entire, like it's, it's bits and pieces of the entire thing. And Adrian, you know, for thank you. First of all, thanks for coming on and having this discussion. It's sometimes it's it's always nice having another person to kind of geek out on this stuff with, and and for to find people who are thinking that holistically about it, and who are who are talking about the the firsthand experience of applying these things. If you were going to give our listeners, uh, you know, one thing to kind of apply from a movement perspective and a nutrition perspective, what would be the, you know, your, your billboard piece of advice for our listeners? You know, since the Spider-Man movies come out, I think I'll do something that people can associate with that. <laughs> there's a universe out there where there's a you who made the harder decision, who gave up the thing that you didn't want to give up, who made the change that you're dying for inside. It's living the life that you could be living. Ask yourself, does what I'm doing support the vision of my future that I truly want in my heart? And follow it. it doesn't have to be the way I believe it. It's all your way, it's all your path. But there are tons of super qualified, passionate, caring individuals out there to help you find light when there's darkness and find your way. Nice, right on. And then Adrian, if people want to find more out about your work, where can they find you online? Right now, I'm still developing adrianvino.com. I'm really slow on it, honestly. I am, I put no time into my own marketing. Everything hmm. is driven around results and knowledge and education and time with clients. That's if I had to improve any aspect of my business and what I admire of the Instagram folks, they do such a better job than me of having mm. reaching people. 
That's why I'm so thankful and grateful to be on this. It, not even if it, even if it doesn't help my business, if it helps one person, I'm glad I spoke. It, it, truthfully, this is not what I was expecting at all. And it's fantastic, <laughs> great experience. And I would encourage anybody else to do it. But the only place that I set up to be found right now is at Adrian Vino on Instagram. And everything else for my business is done through referrals. So that, that's why to and, trainers out there, focus on those results, retain those clients. You'll get those referrals. You, you'll never even need a platform, really, if you do it right. Relationships, results, retention, experience. Like you, you're gonna, that's, that's what it's really about. Because this stuff might go down. You never know. Mm. But the impact you have on a person and what they say about you will help you way more than any Instagram post with your nice Reddit type ups. I'm terrible at it. So, of course, I mock it a bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I could admit that. But you know what I'm, I, it, you know but, what I, I will say, I'm great at, I'm great at marketing and great at copywriting, but there's nothing that beats getting a result for a person and having the word of mouth spread that you care more than anyone else in your field. That will always trump a hundred percent trump anything that you can market <laughs> is the results and the, the, the level of care that you give to other people. I have a question for you gentlemen. Sure. Was this experience and this interview, this whole thing, was this what you expected from what you see of me on Instagram? Uh, to be honest, you know, I only saw uh, last night, I went through your whole feed just quickly and, you know, hitting the, uh, the interesting points. And I, w I would say, no, I was thinking more mechanically, right? I'm, I was thinking we would talk about whack method and functional patterns and like the you know, the biomechanics behind it, but this was a lot more enlightening in terms of uh, the mental side and the, uh, the journey you go through with different types of physical activity. So I, I'd like to thank you for coming on. That was amazing, Adrian. Yeah, and it likewise, really it, 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 it wasn't what I expected, but it was exactly what we needed. So thank you, Adrian, for joining us. Um, for those who are listening on Apple or Spotify, this was recorded live on nofilter.net. It's a live interactive streaming platform where you can actually ask us questions in real time and join the stream yourself. So to view our upcoming streams, go to www.nofilter.net. Look at the upcoming shows. My name is Anthony Manuel. You can find my host page on there. Uh, go check out Adrian's work at Adrian Vino. That's V-E-I-N-O on Instagram. But as you can probably tell from this interview, there is so much more depth to be had from Adrian as a person than what you're going to see on social media. Feel free to reach out to him if you want to learn more about his coaching. Um, and thank you just for doing this. This was an absolute blast. This was a very, very unique episode with the Art of Move. And I'm looking forward to having more conversations like this in the future, man. It was a pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone who listened. There we go. We'll see you next time, guys.